and welcome. In today's video, I'll be making this 1890 ensemble. The ensemble is made from two patterns. The first being from Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion 2 and using the skirt from this dress from the Museum of Costume dated 1890 to 1891. And the second pattern for the abodice will be from Isabella Pritchard's Prior Tires, The Victorian Dressmaker, Volume 1. And it will be this bodice. I really loved how this ensemble turned out, and I hope you enjoy. Here you see me cutting out the front skirt panel from my fabric, a blue, white, and black pinstripe suiting fabric from the IAF Fabric Mart. The skirt of this ensemble features tabs on the bottom, which will be finished independently of the rest of the skirt and took about 3 yards of 60 inch material. I then cut the skirt back, which is simply a shaped rectangle with the tab detail drawn out with chalk. The skirt pieces were then cut out from muslin for lining. If I were to make the skirt again, I'd choose a darker color lining fabric. The reason being is that the lighter color showed when the skirt was bustled at the hem, so I had to line the inside of the skirt with the pinstripe fabric. This wasn't by any means hard, it was just time consuming. Now this is where the construction gets interesting. The lining and the outer fabric are constructed separately at the bottom of the skirt where the tabs are, but as one at the top of the skirt. Hopefully this will make sense as I go on. I am pinning here the bottom 10 inches of the lining at the three seams. I then took a length of the pinstripe fabric and pinned it right sides together and sewed it a quarter inch by machine. After that was sewn, I ironed the pinstripe facing inwards towards the outside of the lining. This is the part that will show behind the tabs of the outer skirt, which is why it needs to be faced. Here I am, just pinning the facing in place. I am making my facing a couple inches wider than the tabs to make sure none of the white is seen. The facing was then sewed by machine. Because of the print of the fabric and because the hem would be mostly covered by my, the tabs, I wasn't worried about the stitching showing, because it barely did anyway. Here is how the hem looked once completed. If I had remembered to order wool braid for this skirt, I would have bound the hem at this time. I did not remember to order some in time for this project. However, I do plan on ordering some to bind this hem in the future, because this fabric is delicate and will wear away with too much friction, which is exactly why Victorians bound their skirt hems. Now I cut nine yards of an inch and a half bias tape to bind the skirt tabs with. I then used cotton cording to turn that nine yards of bias tape into nine yards of piping. Here you see me cutting away the tabs, which I didn't do before because my fabric frayed like crazy and I didn't want to cut into it any sooner than I had to. Now the bottom 10 inches of the skirt was seamed together, just like the lining, except this time it was right sides together, so the seams would be on the inside of the skirt. Now I am pinning the piping around the perimeter of each tab. This was all sewn by machine. After all the piping was sewn, I trimmed the excess with pinking shears and clipped all my corners to make sure everything laid flat when ironing. All the tabs were then ironed open and pinned in that position. To encourage them to stay in this position, I stitched in the ditch using a zipper foot around each tab. Now that the tabs were bound, it was time for decoration. I freehanded this flower loop design you see me marking in the middle of each tab with a chalk pencil. I then machine stitched some Sushaw trim over those chalk marks. I used about 18 inches of trim for each flower, using about 10 yards of trim in total. I would highly recommend doing a test piece to determine how much length of trim is needed for each piece and cutting your trim to that length, then sewing it on. Trying to wrestle with the whole yardage when sewing is much more difficult, and the whole thing went much smoother once I did it the pre-cut way. I then covered the back of the tabs with some extra pinstripe fabric, the tops of which were turned under twice, then sewed by machine. The edge turned under and pinned and secured by hand. This was to finish the backs of the tabs nicely and to provide coverage in case any of them ever flip up. Here you see me pinning together the lining and outer fabric skirt along the rest of the seam. I also did this along the top seam as well. This was then serged together to finish. Here I am pinning the back seam which was sewn using half an inch seam allowance.
Here is how the back seam looked once ironed. The opening at the top is where the placket will be inserted. This placket looks like so. One side is interfaced with band roll, which is a stiff interfacing, and will form the part of the placket that extends under the skirt. The non-interfaced side will fold under the skirt. Here I am pinning the placket pieces in place. The placket pieces were then ironed over and under, respectively. The placket was secured in place by hand using whip stitches. Now that the back seam was taken care of, I moved to the right side seam, which gets a pocket. The top of each pocket piece was faced with a pinstripe fabric. I sewed the pocket pieces using a half an inch, sorry, quarter of an inch seam allowance, then ironed the pocket pieces in place. The rest of the pocket bag and right side seam was then sewn using a half an inch seam allowance. The other side seam was sewn just as a straight line. Easy peasy. The final step of the skirt before the waistband was sewing the skirt darts into the front panel of the skirt. There were six of them. The waistband was a 3.5 inch wide strip interfaced again with band roll and was pinned and sewed along the skirt until I reached the side seams. You'll see why soon. Originally I thought I can get away with traditionally pleating the large back panel. However, with all the fabric back there, I had to turn to cartridge pleating. This is why the waistband wasn't attached to the back panels. You see me ironing the waistband over here and the little bits that hang over will be independently finished and hand whip stitched to the cartridge pleats. Cartridge pleats are formed by two or more parallel rows of gathering stitches and equal lengths pulled taut. I made my pleats about half an inch deep. That is a stitch every other pinstripe. Making sure to use strong buttonhole or upholstery thread and to tie a knot every so many stitches so in case a stitch pops, the whole thing won't unravel. Scarlet at that point wanted to get involved. After the initial pleats were done, I went in and did three more rows of stitches to make them more controlled and nicer looking. On the left you see the before and on the right the after. Much nicer and more stable. This huge bulk was then whip stitched very tightly to the waistband we finished earlier. If I would have thought I was doing cartridge plates from the beginning, I would have done the proper thing of turning down the top part of the fabric of the back panel so none of this raw edge would show. But it turned out alright. I then sewed two hook and eyes into the waistband and four down the pocket. I only have this weird close-up photo of that. Now the final step was sewing two 12 inch cotton tapes at the high hip point onto the side seams. This helps control the back panels and make them lay in their proper place over the bottom. Now that the skirt is done, I can move on to the bodice, which you see me cutting out here. It took two yards of fabric and consisted of 16 pieces. Two vest fronts, two fronts, two side backs, two sides, two backs, two upper sleeves, two lower sleeves, and two collar pieces. The false vest front was cut from a complementary cotton, which was popular in the period. All the pieces, save for the sleeves, also got cut out of some muslin for interlining. All the pieces were then serged to finish. The first step was to sew in the darts into the front pieces. The dart was then ironed toward the front of the bodice. I then pinned the vest front to the front pieces and sewed using a half an inch seam allowance. The seam was then covered with shusha trim. I used about four yards to decorate the bodice. This was stitched by machine. The bottom of the bodice was finished with bias binding. I am finishing the front and back of the bodice separately to make any future adjustments that may be needed easier. If I finish the edge altogether, then I would have to entirely redo it if any alterations were made in the future. Here I am showing you the inside of the front that was fully pinned. The bias binding was sewn down by hand. Now that the fronts were handled, we can move on to the backs. I am pinning the center back seam and the pleat seam as well. These were sewn by machine and the pleat ironed open. I then pinned the side backs and side pieces together to the back and sewed.
The entire piece is finished with bias binding, just like the front piece. I lost my clip of sewing the shoulder seam, but that was the next step. After the shoulder seam was sewn, I could work on the collar. I attached some extra piping to around the interface collar and sewed it in place using a zipper foot. I then attached the other non-interface collar piece and sewed around as well. After this was sewn, I clipped my curves and pressed the collar right sides out. The collar is then pinned to the bodice, sewn, and finished by hand using whip stitches. Now that the collar was sewn, I could sew up the side seam. These have a 1 inch seam allowance to make any future alterations that may be needed easier. Now that the bodice was properly assembled, it was time to bone it. I used 3 quarters of an inch pre-made casings, and 7 millimeter synthetic whalebone. I boned the back seam, side back, side, and dart. The casings were sewn down by hand. After the bodice was boned, I attached a length of cotton tape to the back bones of the waist to serve as my waist tape, which helps hold the bodice snug against your back. I sewed a hook and eye to the front to close it. It was time for Scarlett's help again, as I tried my bodice on to determine the center front, which I marked using basting threads. The front of the bodice was turned under and hand stitched in place. Now it was time for buttons. I used my button gauge to make seven evenly spaced buttonholes. These were all sewn by machine. I then cut them open using a seam ripper. My buttons are 5 eighths of an inch coverable ones. Because my fabric frays, however, I covered my circles with some fray check before gathering them to cover the button. My fabric is too bulky to use the push method. So instead, I gathered them using buttonhole thread and made sure to leave a trail so I could attach the button to the bodice using the same thread. This is how the bodice looked once the buttons were sewn on. I also attached a hook and thread bar at the base of the neck to hold close the little gapping that was happening in the area. Now it was time to move on to the sleeves. Here you see me marking the same design I used on the skirt on the lower portion of the upper sleeve. I sewed two shaw trim onto the flower portion of the design at this point. I then pinned together the upper and lower sleeves and sewed them together. Here you see me ironing and pinning the hem of the sleeves. The sleeves were hemmed by hand using whip stitches. Now that the sleeves were attached, I was able to sew on a line of Sussat trim on top of and under the flower design. The only step left was attaching the sleeves. I matched notches and gathered the rest of the sleeve head to fit the arm's eye. I then basted the sleeve in and tried on the bodice. This is a critical step. It's so much easier to adjust sleeves at this point and sew them on when there's no pins to wrangle with. I sewed them on perfectly on the first go using this method. This is how the sleeves looked once sewn. They have a little poof and are a precursor of the epic poofiness to come in the mid-1890s. As always, everything mentioned in this video and more in the reveal will be linked below. Thanks for watching!